Hi, this is Eddie Hearn, and you're watching Lights Out. This is Faisal Khan for Lights Out in association with Shamrock Boxing, and this is podcast 15 of the Lights Out Boxing podcast. Delighted to be joined by fellow Lights Out team members, Mohsin Gulshir, a.k.a. Ron, and the guy beneath, beneath, underneath us is Asif Khan. How are you doing, lads? Good, good. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. A very exciting times, obviously. Boxing returns to uh, the UK tomorrow night. Uh, Frank Warren's putting on live boxing again for BT Sports. The last few weeks, we've seen top-ranked boxing as well, put on some amazing shows. So it's really exciting times. Um, for boxing and of course we're going ahead with podcast 15 so just want to remind the viewers if they haven't uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button and make sure you're following us on all the social media platforms which is twitter facebook and instagram uh lads you guys ready to get going let's go yeah let's go quick fire question as we do when we start off every podcast from now on uh today's quick fire question is if you was a professional boxer who would you have as your promoter i'm going to answer first my promoter would be Bob Arum. I just think Bob Arum, you know, he's, uh, he's, he, he's been in the game for a very long time. I, I love what he's done with Price and Fury. I love his shows that he's put on. He's got some really, really good talent. I just think he knows how to get the best out of a fighter. And in terms of promoting his fighter, and yeah, Bob Arum for me. I think. The, Basil, the can I ask you something? Go on. Can you do an impression of Bob Arum? <laughs> <laughs> You know, we spoke with Tyson and, you know, we're really excited for the third fight with Deontay. But, yeah, definitely uh, Bob Aaron for me, man. I just, I just like the way he works with his fighters and how he promotes them. And, again, if you look at what he's done with Tyson Fury since uh, return, since Tyson Fury's return to boxing, he's smashed it. Even outside of boxing, getting him in with the WWE, making him a, uh, um, an ambassador for mental health. I just love what he's done with Tyson Fury. Uh, as if, who would your... Um, Promoter be <laughs> uh, Kelly Maloney, aka Frank Maloney. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> now, I would be, um, I'm just gonna go safe for uh, Eddie Hearn. You know, in the UK, you've got Eddie Hearn, you've got Frank Warren. But for me, Eddie Hearn, you know, he's the main fish, he's uh, he's got his uh, he's got his hands in different pies. You know, he's, he's got the dessert, the, the zone in America, he's doing well over here. All the top fighters, are all with him, so. I, I would stick safe and go with fast car ready. I think a lot of fighters, probably, well, a lot of people would because um, Eddie Hearn is uh, he's, he's quite high up there. Um, Ron, who would your choice be? <laughs> I mean, I like Eddie Hearn in the UK. I'm just trying to think of um, who am I? Only in America. <laughs> who am I talking about? The Duke from uh, Rocky Five. Duke. <laughs> Sue me for what? <laughs> yeah, touch me and I'll sue you. <laughs> yes, 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 that's the one. Touch me and I'll sue you. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, in the UK, it would definitely have to be Eddie Hearn. Um, I just think he, he promotes his fighters. He does, you know, like, look look at the job he's done with uh, Anthony Joshua, raising his profile and getting him those lucrative fights, ab you know, abroad. It's not worked out for him initially, but it came good in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and earned him a lot, is um, Anthony Joshua a lot of money, so... Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of fighters these days, some of them don't even have a promoter. So, you know, I mean, would you want to promote yourself? That's perhaps maybe uh, another question for another podcast. But, okay, I've gone with Bob Arum. used to, buy, used to have gone with uh, good old Eddie Hearn. Uh, let's move on. First topic, King Ryan Garcia. A lot of noise about this guy, a lot of hype about this guy. Um, news broke to us at the beginning of this week that he's accepted a fight with Luke Campbell, which has been ordered by the WBC for the interim belt. Ben and as a final eliminator to decide Devin Haney's next mandatory. Now, Garcia also had the option of a WBO eliminator against Emmanuel Taggio. What does this say about Ryan Garcia choosing Luke Campbell for his next opponent and as a final eliminator to take on Devin Haney? No. I mean, well, go on, I'll let, I'll let Asif go first. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I was looking at this Taggio's um, record and other than his first debut, you know, when he, when he made his debut, other than that, I think he's won every fight. So I think it's a toss up really between, you know, do you go with Campbell, who's probably more well known? Um, 
there's a blueprint of how to beat him as well. So I think they've probably gone out of the two probably for the safer option. I, I know we, you know, we know a lot about Luke Campbell. We know he's a great fighter, but unfortunately, when he's take, you know, he's gone for that next step up in class, he, he's just come short. But I think it, Luke Campbell looks a a lot better name on 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 Garcia's record um, mm. at the moment. I probably think that's why, you know, he, he's he's taken that fight. King Ryan Garcia is twenty and zero. And I think, obviously, apart from a world title, I think the only thing he lacks is a big name on his CV. But I look at it, and I've got to give credit to Ryan Garcia because I think Luke Campbell, he he's a very experienced fighter. He's fought for a world title twice, and he's been in there with probably the best fighter in that division in Vasyl Lomachenko. I mean, Ron, when you, when you look at Ryan Garcia choosing Luke Campbell as his next opponent, what does that say about uh, Ryan Garcia? Big cojones. That's the first thing. You know, he's a young kid. He's only 21. Um, he's very highly, you know, hyped in the US, you know, along with Devin Haney's and uh, the Gavanta Davises. And that division is lit right now. So, you know, you've got to better make big moves if you want to be a king of that division. You know, you can't be taking the easy option. And I think in Luke Campbell, I, I'm a big fan of Luke Campbell. Um, you know, he's had some, yeah, he has come up short, but there's some top-level operators that he's come up short against. Mm. Linares, that was a close fight. That could have gone either way. I mean, it was a very close decision, that one. A split decision, I think it was. Mm. Uh, he Early on in his career, he lost against Mendy, which yeah. he obviously, you know, avenged that defeat. Mm -hmm. um, and then, obviously, most recently, Vasily Lomachenko. And that performance that he put against L Lomachenko, you know, it wasn't as straightforward what Lomachenko is used to. So... Lomachenko had to work for it and you know he did get dropped but you know he came back you know stood on his feet and he finished the fight you know so well, you yeah. know looking at this potential this fight with Ryan Garcia and Luke Campbell people are going to look at it and think Ryan Garcia there's a lot of uh, hype surrounding him he's the next big thing he's mm. undefeated but what people don't seem to realise is that those two world title fights with Linares and Luke and uh, Lomachenko gives Luke Campbell the edge in terms of experience and I think that gives him an advantage because this is you know this is a fight that Ryan Garcia is going to get tested in and Luke Campbell is also a fighter that's you know I think he's 32 years old now knows that time's not his best friend and if he wants to get another crack at a world title shot this is a fight that he has to win so and again you know when you look at boxing I think experience it counts for everything and I just think that the experience that Luke Campbell has over Ryan Garcia is massive, it's big and it's massive. Um, do you think the experience would give like Luke Campbell the advantage going into this fight? Possibly, oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, he's been in the names that we've just mentioned, world class operators. Um, I mean, this is this is very similar to the situ situation with Shakur Stevenson fighting against um, who am Josh, I Warrington. Here? Josh Warrington, you know, um. And this is last uh, for Luke Campbell to stay relevant in that division. Mm. This mm. is probably his, one of his last shots. Mm. Um, as Asif said, he's come short. So this is his time to shine. Luke Campbell, you know, needs to really, put, you know, d make his, um, you know, kind of put in a dominant performance. Otherwise, he's going to get left aside because there's so many contenders in that, you know, that lightweight division. Mm. Yeah, no, hundred percent yeah, agree. I think yeah, Ryan Garcia. I mean, if it's it's all about making making the move at the right time because that division, as as Ron says, the division is 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 a hot division, and and if you get in and you know in that mix with the top fighters, then you're going to be around and you're going to be in the big fights pretty soon. So I think it's a calculated risk, and like I said, I think the main thing is that you know Campbell has been beaten, so there's a blueprint of how to beat him. So I think. It's a, I think it's a, it's a good fight. You know, obviously as a Brit, you want to see Campbell do well. Um, but I think now we'll see all this hype about Ryan Garcia, and there is has been a lot of hype about him. Let's see how, um, let's see how how really how real that really is. The W the WBC title is uh, is held by um, Devin Haney, and of course the WBO is held by Vasyl Lomachenko. You know, Ryan. I mean, again. Ryan Garcia, for me, would probably go into the fight as the favourite because he's undefeated. He, you know, he's on a good run at the moment. 17 knockouts. 
we can only go with what we know so far. The bookies have already made Ryan Garcia as the favourite. Now, does Ryan Garcia, if he can get past Luke Campbell, does he, has, does he have more of a chance of beating Devin Haney or does he have more of a chance of beating Vasil Lomachenko? Who, let, you know, let's, you know, Vasil Lomachenko is a, is a phenomenal fighter and he is ranked, for me, in the top five in the current pound for pound list. But when I look at some of his fights, you know, he's put on the floor by Linares and I don't think we saw the best Vasil Lomachenko when he fought um, Luke Campbell. So, do you, do you think Ryan Garcia would look at those two performances and think that, yes, a fight with Vasil Lomachenko makes more sense? Or has he gone for Devin Haney and this WBC option because Devin Haney quite doesn't have the experience as Lomachenko does? I mean, Lomachenko is a polished professional. I mean, what is his but amateur his, record? But, but, but his last two fights, well, sorry... What yeah, a few of his last given, few fights, they've not been, yeah. you know, as convincing as you would expect them to be. Like I said, um, he beat Anthony Corolla. No disrespect to Anthony Corolla, he was on his way out. But the performance against Linares, he had to get off the canvas. And again, the performance against it Luke Campbell I mean, was, was not what we expected. Lockdown. He wasn't really troubled. It was like a, a short, straight they got caught with. And, you know, he was back up on his feet again. And, you know, and he finished that fight off. And, you know, we know the end result, how that fight finished. Corolla, he did what he, he out completely outboxed mm. Corolla. Corolla had mm. no clue. The footwork was on point there, um, and you know Corolla, who was interviewed afterwards, and he said that he was, I had, you know, he was like a swarm of bees, the way Lomachenko was fighting. Um, you know, I, I mean that that would be the natural progression that you know I would like to see him fighting Devin Haney if he wins this mm. fight, then Lomachenko if that was to happen, you know, for all the marbles, well, or you know. We, we yeah. talk about. I mean, talk, I mean, we know what uh, Lomachenko's got fighting. He's fighting Tia Fuma, Fuma mm. Lopez on the other side. Mm, so yeah. it kind of sets it up really nicely. That does. That's if you're just gonna you're just gonna say something, there before. No, no, I was gonna say, and he's got uh, he's got a tough fight himself against mm. uh, against Lopez. So um, yeah, I think the division's set up really nicely. I mean, you know, I think you know towards the end of the year, probably you know early next year, we'll we'll, we'll probably see the. I, I want to see Devin Haney versus. Uh, Lomachenko. That's for me. That's a that there is 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 the top two fighting each other in my opinion because they're both. I mean Lomachenko, like Ron said. I mean he's been he's been dropped. He he you know he made light work of Luke Campbell, but it was it was a tough fight. So um, but for me Devin Haney, I think he's the one that if anyone's going to dethrone Lomachenko, it's going to be him. I'm, I, I I agree with you as well, Asif. I mean, the, the, the setting up one thing about this division is it sets up nicely because you know the lightweight division it's it's action packed. It's got some good talent in it as well, and it's got three or four fighters that potentially you know think to themselves that they can actually go on and be an undisputed champion in this division. Who, who's, but um, I don't, sorry, let me cut. Who's Javonte? Who, who's the tank fighting? Is oh, he? There you go. There's another one. There's another there's name. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he's. He's, I mean, he, again, man, someone you, you know, you wish was managed a lot better because I think if he was, he'd be in these fights. He'd be, his name mm. would be mentioned. You know, it wouldn't be at the end of a conversation. It'd be at the beginning of, of a conversation. And that, he's a, he's a beast in itself. He's a tank. Mm -hmm. But it's um, whether or not he's managed right and he, and he gets these fights. So is, is he scheduled to fight anyone or? I've not heard anything. I, I believe but... he's having a few issues with his promoter. I mean, Eddie Hearn was, I was heard that he might be signing him. Uh, well, Eddie Hearn, Eddie, I mean, Eddie Hearn was asked, who would, who would you, you know, in a, who would you want to sign if you could, you know, and he was in his, like, you know, top three. So it shows out how highly rated he's for of in the boxing boxing world. It's just at the moment, he's in that, he's in that place, isn't he? He's in that place where you mention him at the end of a conversation. Oh, what about Tank? Rather than right at the beginning mm -hmm. when you mentioned Lomachenko and that. So, yeah, he, well, he the, uh, for me... But, He's, he's, he's a great fighter. We, we've just m named six quality operators in that division. You know, um, uh, Lopez, Lomachenko, Haney, Tank, uh, Garcia, and of course, Luke Campbell. That just goes to show you how exciting the lightweight division is. And you know, one thing I really, really like about the lightweight division right now is we're getting to see those big fights. You know, Garcia versus Campbell is a big fight. And of course, Lopez, Teofimo Lopez, and uh, Vasil Lomachenko is, an, is another big fight. Um, a prediction for that fight, I'm going to go for a Ryan Garcia, Ryan Garcia points decision, but I would say this is going to be the toughest fight of his career because Luke Campbell's a good fighter, one, and two, because he's got more, he's more experience in terms of those world title challenges and, of course, he's, 
you know, he's fought great names such as Lenores and, of course, Lomachenko. So I'm going to go for a points decision win for Ryan Garcia. But again, I don't see it being an easy fight. What do you guys think? I'll go with Luke Campbell. Um, yeah. I just think he's been in with, with the better operators. Mm. Experience will pay off. Ryan Garcia still, you know, it's, it's the American hype. We've seen a mm. lot of these fighters that are really talked about by the American, you know, um, journalists as the next big thing. You know, I remember uh, Jeff Lacey came along. Do you remember that? Mm. And he was yeah. supposed to be, and we know how that finished off. Um, so could we see another upset here? You know, so I, I reckon um, Luke Campbell to win by points. That's if your prediction for that fight? Luke Campbell. You know, he's a Brit, so you want to get behind the Brits. But I just think it's, I think he's due that big break, man. I think, like, you know, he's, when he stepped up, he's, he's, just, he's just come short. And I think he's due that, that big break. And, and I think it might just be a bit too... How old is... Um, Cause he's 21, isn't he? 21, yeah. yeah. So I think he might just be a step up just a bit too early, but... You know, they say you, you see how good a fighter is against the opposition. So we might see, you know, a, a side to Ryan Garcia that we've never seen before. But as a Brit, um, you know, I'm backing Luke Campbell. We've got a lot of time for Luke Campbell. He's had a good career. And as you mentioned, he's just come up short. But I just think there's something special about Ryan Garcia. And I think we will see it on tonight. But again, it's going to be a tough fight. It's going to be an exciting fight because the winner gets a shot at that uh, WBC lightweight title, which is currently held by... Devin Haney. Uh, let's move on now. Another Brit we're going to talk about is Billy Joe Saunders, who's ruled himself out the Canelo fight. And um, I'm just going to read a few quotes as he's dropped his head. Um, ruled himself out the Canelo fight because I'm not ready for September. You can say to me, Billy Joe Saunders, a billion pounds, but you're not ready and you're going to get beat. I would say, keep it. Let me get ready. Let me win. And I'll fight for free. I'm nobody's stepping stone. I'm not another belt for Canelo. If you want to play mind games with me, that don't work with me. I play the biggest mind games in British boxing. They want to get me on short notice and take, make me take a pay cut. Why can't Canelo take a pay cut? Right. So we, before we went off air last week, um, Asif and Montel, who unfortunately is not here today, had a bit of a, um, a bit of back and forth debate about Billy Joe Saunders. Um, now, Ron, we spoke about this last night when we met up, and um, I've got, I'm a big Billy Joe Saunders fan. I just think he's a, he's a fighter that's got so much more to show, and he can achieve so much more. And he's one of the fighters that I can actually see beating Canelo on the night if he can turn up. But, but when you look at what's been going on the last four months, the whole coronavirus, I've, we, I've been doing interviews, I speak to a lot of fighters, they've been staying in shape. When Billy Joe Saunders turns around and says September is not enough time to prepare for this fight, does it got, make you guys think that he's actually taking this fight serious or should he be ready for September? What's he been doing the last four months, man? Uh, uh, that, that's what begs the question. I mean, uh, we know, I mean, I've been following Tyson Fury on uh, the social media. You know, he's been doing up his, uh, you know, fitness regime. I thought Billy Joe Saunders is a fighting man. He would have jumped at this, uh, this opportunity. You know, considering, you know, he had that bit of a backlash for his comments that he made, uh, which he's apologised for. He's done some great work with his charity, you know, with his um, um, raising money for the NHS, for the nurses and bringing the food. But I was a bit disappointed, you know, because he talks a good game. And I was like, yes, come on, you know, that opportunity, he would have jumped at that. But it's not meant to be. And I'm really mm. surprised at that, really shocked. I think Ron made a great point there. He talks a good game. And in the past, he's been super critical of... of less, we're going to go into Chris Eubank Jr. in a bit, of Chris Eubank Jr. of talking and talking and saying, I'm ready for Triple G, and then not being ready for Triple G. Like Ron said, yeah, this guy, he was... he was They were scheduled to fight, right? And then obviously it got... it got, um, it got Cancelled because of the pandemic. Cancelled. So he was scheduled to fight. So he was in camp for that. And obviously, with everything that's going on, we don't know what these boxers are doing, whether they're training, you know, what kind of level they're training at. But when the opportunity comes to fight the pound for pound number one fighter, he's not, they're not giving him four weeks' notice. We're talking September. Normally, September, they do what Cinco, what is it, on the ninth or fifth? Yeah, they haven't had that this year, have they? Yeah, so, 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 mm. so September, the middle of, we're talking two months, mm. a training camp. I mean, come on, man. I mean, you've, you've, you've asked for it. You've said you'll, you've, you can beat him. 
you've got the opportunity and you've turned it down. Who knows if this, if this, um, if this opportunity will be there again? So the, no, the question is why? why? Why don't you want to fight in September? Because I, I'm looking at it and I think, um, you know, uh, for example, they're asking Billy Joe Saunders to take a pay cut. You know, one thing I've always said about boxers is that they, they know they were, you know, people slated Daniel White for not taking the, for not stepping in for Jerome Miller last year uh, to, to replace him to fight Anthony Joshua. And, you know, we look back at the interviews we did with brother Dean White, both the, the offers were, you know, they were ridiculous. Andy Ruiz was getting more, offered more than us. And, you know, at the time, Daniel White was a bigger name than Andy Ruiz in that, in that division. I mean, surely, surely we, you know, you, you've got to look at it from Billy Joe's point of view. If he wants more time, to, this would be the biggest fight of his career. If he doesn't feel that September's not the right time to take this fight and he's not getting what he deserves, then surely he deserves some credit for not just jumping into it. You know, he could risk it, get absolutely outclassed, and then that's it, his career could be over. Nobody might ever touch him in boxing again. Can, surely we should be giving him the benefit of the doubt. But the, there's the, the flip side of that, yeah, so we're, we're talking about the financial side. So let's, let's look at the current climate that we're in in this world now. Nothing's the same. I'm, I'm guessing fighters that for last year are probably not getting paid anywhere near what they're getting paid now because of obviously the live gay and everything that goes around it. So, I mean, the, to, to talk about the financial side is hard. But you said something there first. So you said the chance might not come around again. So let's see if, let's say Canelo goes and fights. I mean, there's talk of, I mean, what was it? Callum? No, not Callum Jones. It's yeah, yeah, Callum Jones. Well, yeah. um, John Ryder. Well, that's, that's John, some, yeah. So, so, did, so let's say he goes and wins that fight. And then I see this comment um, about um, Billy Joe Saunders saying, in December, I'll probably fight and I'll fight um, Callum Smith. So, I mean, if he loses that fight, then, you know, you said the opportunity might never come again. It won't come again because mm -hmm. he, he doesn't have no... At the moment, he's, is he still got a belt or is that being... Yeah, yeah. No, no, he's still a he, super... He's still a world, world So he's got, that, he's got that hole. He's got that, um, he's got that to use as bait as to why... The number one pound for pound fighter would want to fight him. He loses that, then he has nothing, and he probably he will never see Canelo in, in the ring again, mm. other than if he's watching it from ringside. Ron, is this a smart move? Do you think he's done the right thing by not taking the fight in September, or do you, do you give him some credit for not rushing into it? No, look, it would have been his biggest payday, regardless. You know, mm. this fight. You know, he wouldn't have made peanuts. You know, mm. as we've discussed on this show, Canelo is a cash cow. You know, yeah. you have a fight with Canelo, you're making some six figures, you know, yeah. um, minimum. Minimum. And look, he, get, he causes an upset and beats Canelo. You get a rematch. Yeah, but Canelo's you know not going to walk away and uh, yeah. licking his wounds and thinking, you get a rematch and that's going to mm. be worth three or yeah. four times as much. To go to Vegas so, you know, and to beat, to beat Canelo, you have to at least win. 10 of the 12 rounds and that's even no, you, but, but you, you want to we, yeah. we know just because we, we, you know we've you, 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 had you, discussions about Canelo um, uh, no, boxer, Joe in, no boxer in, no boxer in the world is going to go there and get a points decision against Canelo yeah but, that, but well, let's, let's be honest man that's how, Billy, that, Joe's, that, Billy Joe Saunders ain't knocking out Canelo Alvarez so no, no. And, and you want to talk about a perfect time to fight him would be ASAP because you know, who knows what training this guy's been doing. He's, Canelo last fighted when? Last year? Uh, against Kovalev, yeah. So he's had that layoff as well, just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. So you want to give him the chance to get in the ring in September, dust off the cobwebs, and then you want to hopefully catch him, you know, beginning of next year or something. It's just, mm -hmm. I, For me, like I said, I've done this at the beginning because, I, look, we had this discussion last time. For me, Billy Joe Saunders, yeah, he is a great fighter, but he's all that. He's more that... that than this. I mean, he's always in the news for what? For this, mm. not that. And he, and, he, and he's, he's come up again. One thing I'm looking at this whole Canelo situation now, um, towards the back end of last week, Canelo offered Sergei Devryanchenko a shot at the world title, a mandatory defence. And now they're looking at uh, John Ryder. I'm looking at Canelo's choices of opponents. You know, Devryanchenko and John Ryder, they, Billy Joe Saunders, all the way up there. Billy Joe Saunders has turned the fight down for obvious reasons because obviously money and because not having enough time. You know, you've got to look at it from this point of view. Why is, you know, why is Canelo not looking to fight the likes of a Demetrius Andrade or a, a Callum Smith, you know, a third fight with Triple G, you know, Jose Benavidez, you know, why, I mean, even, we, 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 I believe it was what, Bivol that turned, Dimitri Bivol that turned around and said he'd love to fight him as well and he's even winning 
to step down. Why is it that Canel? I mean, I can understand. You know, he wants to get back into the ring, maybe you know, shape, you know, shake off a few cobwebs. But why is Canel looking at opponents such as Devryanchenko and John Ryder? No disrespect to them, but why is he not looking at the bigger names in this in this division at either perhaps middleweight or super middleweight, even light heavyweight? It is, you know, because look, he can. That's it. Because yeah, as, can, as, as Canelo, he is a he's a superstar of boxing. He yeah. is a face of boxing, whether you like mm. it or not. I mean, I remember when uh, Mayweather, mm. I can't remember who he fought for his 50th fight. Everyone was like, what the hell? You know, I can't remember. Was Conor McGregor. 50th fight. No, 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 Conor before McGregor that, before Conor fight. McGregor. I can't remember who it was, but people were like, well, he's like, well, I can fight whoever I want, you know? Mm. Uh, it makes sense for him because he, he can ease his way back in. He's had some tough fights. You know, Kov that Kovalev fight was, you know, he, you know, he's a bigger guy that he went, you know, stepped up in weight. Mm -hmm. You know, it has an impact on your body, kind of getting punched by a bigger guy. So maybe he's I'm, I'm, easing this, his way back into this it. This whole situation with Binjo Saunders, don't get me wrong, really do want to see him fight the likes of Canelo, Callum Smith and even a Golovkin because being at the age that he is right now, he needs these fights. Mm. He needs these names on his CV. But I wish he'd got some inspiration from Tyson, man. Well, Tyson well, Fury should have inspired look, him, man. I mean, yeah. if, if he feels that the September's not enough time and he's not going to rush it, because it, it would be the biggest fight of his career, then you know, you've got to give him some credit. But as we as you mentioned, Chris Eubank Jr. responded to all this on Twitter by sending a tweet out saying, Billy Bottle Job Saunders won't fight Canelo in two months. I'm ready to go in two days, so I'll fight in September. <laughs> no problem. Now, as if big fan of Chris Eubank Jr., we all know what happened when these two fought. Bill Joe Saunders beat him. Now, you got that. Everybody loves a good old rivalry, a good old British tear-up in boxing. You know, we've seen fighters have rematches in, in Britain. You know, we saw White and Chisora do it, and that was, you know, an epic rivalry. Would, if you, let's just say you're Billy Joe Saunders right now. Would you take that fight with uh, Chris Eubank Jr. next? Or would you look at the likes of Callum Smith and Canelo and think, no, these are the fighters I want to be fighting? I can see why he he probably dis, dismisses Chris Eubank Jr. because it's not it's it's not that elite fight it's not that super fight domestically it is you know in the UK it would do big numbers it would it would it would draw a lot of attention but you know obviously he he wants to fight or he says he wants to fight Canelo he says he wants to fight um, Callum Smith so. Um, yeah, I mean, for me as a fan, as a boxing fan, I, like I said, I love Chris Eubank Jr. And I'd love to see them two fight because for me, you know, before the fight, the trash talking, it was perfect. You know, you tuned in for the press conferences. The fight was a good fight as well. Um, and I think, I think they've both come on uh, since that fight as well. So um, I'd want to see that fight. I don't think it'd happen anytime soon, but Chris Eubank Jr. has got a good way of of keeping his nose in, in, in the mix. You know, he sends out tweets. He's always... He's always commenting on things. I mean, I think there's a few more back and forth, wasn't there? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's ideal if I read out what was said. I think it was like a Chawney comeback <laughs> that uh, Billy Joe Saunders said about, about uh, you know, part of the anatomy. But, um, yeah, there's always going to be that needle there. And I think that probably will, that will be a fight we will see, but I don't think it'll be in the next, you know, in the next 12 months or so. Ron Asif just said that Chris Eubank Jr. has kind of gone on from there. And I'm going to have to speak for Montelli. I like Chris Eubank Jr., you know, I think he's very talented. But when you say gone on from there, I mean, you have to look at it. Billy Joe Saunders has won two world titles from since then. Chris yeah, but I, I know, you, I know you're going to go into, I know you're going to no, go no. to Ron now, but let me butt in here and say something. Yeah, I think if, are you, are you telling me if Chris Eubank would have fought Lemieux, you wouldn't have beat him? Yeah, I think he would have beaten him. So you would have beaten him. So, you know, we, we can't, for me, but, look, but if, yeah, if, 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 if Billy Joe Saunders would have fought George Groves, Billy Joe Saunders would have beaten him. I don't think he would have. I think, I think Styles have. make fights. Nah, I don't think he would have. I think, you know, Groves beat Eubank because Eubank's a come forward fire. Billy, Billy Joe Saunders there come, you know, come forward oh. fire. He fights on the back foot. I want to add to that. I mean, Billy Joe Saunders hasn't been that active, to be honest. Hmm. You know, there's been long layoffs. There's been issues with you know, getting into trouble outside of the ring. You know, it's a shame we haven't seen much of it. And he's put on some terrible shows as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, balls, uh, you know, he's not it's the most exciting. Yeah, <laughs> we went to that, didn't we? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I like Chris Eubank. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully he's learned a lot from those two losses. That he's, you know, he, but he's going to get it more. You know, he's going to get it from the media because he is, you know, Eubank's. He's seen, you know, he's got a dad like Eubank Senior. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's enough for him to kind of get a lot more slack than compared to the average fighter does. I just think, I just look at Eubank Junior. I think he's so talented as well, and you know, part of me wants to see him achieve something. I mean, yeah, he's won two IBO titles, but you know, a lot of people don't really look at IBO titles as, you know, the, wow, and you, they don't get excited over it. I just, I do want to. I mean, I, I thought his performance against James DeGale was really good, but I'd rather see him do that with against a, a Callum Smith or or a Golovkin because I do think there are certain fighters I can I see. Eubank Jr. being able to beat right now and I personally think a fighter that he's got a good chance against is because I don't think you know he's the same fighter as he was a few years ago as a, as a fighter like Golovkin I think Eubank Jr. has a great chance against someone like Golovkin you know, I've even read stuff on Twitter that Rocky Fielding you know regardless of what you think of him is a former world champion for Canelo is a, is, is interesting fighting Eubank Jr. that's another name you'd want to put in your CV you know as you've said one thing which I agree with you know he's always stayed He's always been a name that's, you know, stayed in that, you know, amongst those big fighters. But mm. you, you go around and say, you know, next gen this, next gen that. But you're kind of like at that stage of your career now where you're past next gen, uh, the, past those next gen fighters now. You're at a certain age where you have to start achieving something and you've got to beat big names on your CV. I mean, ever since he beat James DeGale, he's had one fight and that was against Korobov and that got stopped halfway through due to an injury. So when you look at Billy Joe Saunders and Chris Eubank Jr., they're brilliant fighters. They tech, well, technically, Billy Joe Saunders is a better fighter. Chris Eubank Jr. is a good come forward fighter. But they're fighters that haven't really moved on to that level where you'd think, yeah, they're there right now. You know, mm -hmm. Callum Smith... They've not stayed at that level, right? Yeah, exactly. no, until 100%. They're, 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 they're up there and then they're back down there. Yeah. You know, I mean, after fighting James DeGale, you'd stay at that level, you'd push on. But I think he got injured after that. There was a bit of a layoff, and then he, he yeah. come back and he fought someone who got injured. Um, and same with B. Joe Saunders. You know, he has these great wins, but then he's he's in you know no disrespect to Stevenage, but he's in fighting in a, a small hall fight. So um, yeah, totally agree with what you're saying. But for me, Chris Eubank Jr. Look, man, the guy's a he's an animal. He's we talk about Chris Eubank Senior. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you top that? He goes on top of it by now training, living with Roy Jones Jr. Mm -hmm. So the guy's always. You, you know, you, you can always talk about him. You know, there's, you can always tell a story about him. You can always, you know, about his dad and now about Roy Jones Jr. Um, for me, I just think we, we'll start seeing the best of him now, especially now that he's he's nailed down a trainer. Um, and I think now we'll start seeing the best of Chris Eubank Jr. So, you know, we've, we've spoken about this whole Chris Eubank Jr. thing, Ron. You know, we've said that he's a fighter that can potentially achieve so much more. He's working with Roy Jones Jr. now. But the inactive, you know, being inactive, you know, not really pushing on since that win over James to Gale. When you, when you look at this situation with Eubank Jr., what do you think the best step is for him next? You know, in terms of what name does he need to be putting on his CV? Because I don't see him getting a fight with a Canelo or a Golovkin. Who would you be looking at right now for you as Chris Eubank Jr.? And who would you want to be fighting next? Mm. Um, I mean, I'd like to see, I'd like to see him with um, Callum Smith. Yeah, mm. I mean, like you know, he's gonna he's gonna be working on a few things with um, Roy Jones Jr. Mm -hmm. You know, to improve his style. But he's at that age now. He's 30, 31, I think he is. Chris Eubank mm -hmm. Jr. So is it too late in his career to be kind of teaching uh, new tricks to? So I mean, that's a fight I'd love to see. You mm -hmm. know, if relevant, it's. Um, and what I admire about Chris Eubank Jr., he gives off that impression that he doesn't care. You know, he just wants to fight. You know, I remember his famous line, uh, I can't remember, he goes, my, my corner doesn't have do towels. You know, referring mm. to he doesn't quit. He's got that warrior mentality about him. They, they don't, um, they, he also doesn't listen to his corner as well. So. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember that, but that was the oddest. I remember when we go back to the corner and there was nothing. There was no one yeah. saying any instructions. This is what you need. To... But hopefully, you know, that, you know, he was with Martinez in his last two fights. Now with um, 
uh, what do you want to call it, Roy, Roy Jones Jr. Jr. I, I'm curious to see how that works out. You know, as, as, as if it's, it's, has he made the right move in going in going over to train with one of the guys that's considered one of the best of all time? You know, in Roy Jones Jr. So I, I was reading about. I think he's so he's keeping his his old trainer around. I think he's mm-hmm. going to be their trainer. But to have Roy Jones Jr. to be, I think he's living with him at the moment. So to live in that environment, to to learn from one of the best of all times, you know, it's it's not going to do you no harm, is it? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Ron's point exactly was, you know, about the corner and not listening to the trainers and that. It's, I remember he fought, um, was it Gary Gary O'Sullivan? Yeah, Spike O'Sullivan. Like, and and yeah. he had he had he had Adam Booth in his corner for that um, for that one and only fight. And you saw glimpses of what he is capable of, of with having a, a trainer in his corner. Hundred mm-hmm. um, percent agree with Ron when he says, you know, is it too late to start teaching someone, you know, at that age who's been used to a specific way throughout his whole boxing life, which is, you know, train your own way. But it's exciting to to see, you know, he. I've, I've watched his interviews with Sky and that, and he, and he seems excited he, you know he's talking about Roy Jones Jr like you know it's like us I mean imagine you know we're all football fans and, and we trained with Steven Gerrard or, or Ron trained with Luke Chadwick it's uh you know which <laughs> we'd be we we'd up our game and we'd we'd want to know uh, and learn a lot more so um yeah let's see what happens hey Luke Chadwick's got one Premier League medal more than uh Steven Gerrard though yeah. Start, Jimmy Trier has got one more Premier League medal than Eric Cantona. <laughs> Divo Karigi has got more Champions League final appearances than. Please, bro, uh, game started, please. Uh, oh, but anyway, let's yeah, so we're, we're, we're not, let's, let's 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 stick on this. Right. So no, I, I agree with you, but I think if anything, if someone's going to get the best out of Chris Eubank Jr., it's going to be someone like Roy Jones Jr. Um, and yeah, so back 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 to your question about fighter first of all, who who he should fight Triple G, hundred percent. I think. Triple G and him, I think he would struggle massively against Callum Smith. Callum Smith, to me, is he is the one to beat because he's got it all. The size, he can box, back foot, front foot. He's got the power. He's going to cause everyone problems. And, and there's a reason why no one wants to fight him because they know he's, he's a massive threat. And I think if Eubank Jr. fought him, he, I think that would be the one fight where he'd get found out. I think Callum Smith is. is, I, is I, I think right now Chris is, is a really good time for for anyone to fight Triple G. No disrespect to him, but I don't think it's the same fighter as he is. Watch the fight against Derevianchenko. There's a lot missing from this Triple G to the one that you had back to when he beat the likes of Golovkin. You know, I think his his age is starting to show. But I don't think Triple G would want to entertain that fight because he's at a certain age where he's probably thinking maybe a few more fights, make as much money as possible and get that third and final fight with Canelo now. I think right now a good fight for him is because, listen, there's no disrespect to Chris Eubank Jr., but you, you know your Callum Smiths and your, your Billy Joe Saunders, these guys, they want to fight the big, big names right now. I don't think these guys are going to look at someone like Eubank Jr. and think, yeah, do you know what, I'll take the Eubank Jr. fight. This. Callum Smith right now would love to fight someone like a, a Canelo, maybe even a Golovkin or a Benavides, and same with Billy Joe Saunders. But I just think right now Eubank Jr., for, to benefit his career, fight someone like Rocky Fielding. He's not a bad fighter, former world champion, got good experience. Fight someone like Rocky Fielding. You know, you've got a, a British domestic bust up at the O2 Arena, put in a good performance. And then, you know, you've got people talking, well, look who you've beaten. The Gale, you know, Rocky Fielding. You're under Roy Jones Jr. now. You know, it raises his profile. And then it gets the other guys thinking that, yeah, this is a new, you know, it's a new um, Eubank Jr., I just think a fight with Rocky Fielding right now makes sense because if he fights a Callum Smith or a Canelo and he loses that fight, there's no way back for for Eubank Jr. I think he's just trading on, egg, on, on, on eggshells right now and really do think he's one fight away from saying, you know, that's it now. This is his last opportunity. I would say take a fight with someone like Rocky Fielding, beat Rocky Fielding convincingly and then look at the likes of the Billy Joe Saunders, the Callum Smiths, even the Golovkins. But only time will tell. Um, last topic of uh, podcast 15. Yesterday we heard that Daniel White and Mark Tibbs have parted ways with each other. Bit of a shocker because the Povetkin fight's only around the corner now. We all know Daniel White's been out in Portugal training with the likes of Xavier Miller, who I spoke to a few weeks ago. 
Um, Mark Tibbs, a great coach, you know, also split with uh, Richard Riakpour as well, which was quite surprising. Uh, but we all know Mark Tibbs has opened his own gym, um, looks after Harvey Horn, another good up and coming uh, British fighter. Is this the right time to be switching trainers when you know you're not far off from a big fight with Povetkin and potentially a world title shot within the next six months? I think under Mark Tibbs, he's made some big improvements in his um, as a boxer, as an athlete. You know, if we just go, if we trace back to 2015 when um, Dillian White first fought against, um, you know, when he fought against AJ, you know, that wasn't the best of a uh, Dillian White there. You know, it was, um, you know, Dillian White would be the first one to admit that, you know, his diet wasn't right, his training method wasn't right. So him and Mark Tibbs got together. They were, they've been training up in Loughborough, you know, with all that sports science, you know, putting a sweet science to it, his training methods, his diet, his nutrition. And, you know, we see him now. He's a lot in better shape as well. And, you know, let's look at the, you know, all the of people that he's beaten with Mark Tibbs. You know, let's not kind of kid that. I mean, that's a great achievement itself. So Mark Tibbs has got to be uh, congratulated for that. You know, he played a big role um, in that. So I just think it's unfortunate that how it's come about at such a wrong time. Just four, what is it now? Four or five weeks before the mm -hmm. fight against um, Povetkin. Povetkin. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe they could have just toughed it out. They said, look, let's see off this Povetkin fight, then we'll, we'll go our separate ways. That would have been better. But maybe, you know, we, we don't know if Dillian White's got something that he's doing already with another trainer mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of, to, to make sure that doesn't, you know, kind of disrupt his preparation for the fight. Yeah. Well, as if, um, when you, like I mentioned, the, the Povetkin fight around the corner, hearing rumours that Deontay Wilder might not be ready for a third fight and Dillian White will potentially get his shot at the world title, perhaps maybe in, in December, I'm reading a lot of news about that. Is this the right time to be changing uh, trainers? And when you look at what Mark Tibbs has done, is there a trainer out there that could get Dillian White to that next level, i.e. becoming world champion? I don't think it's ever a great time splitting from, from your trainer, especially leading up to a fight. Maybe, you know, in between camps, but... In leading up to a massive fight, because it is a massive fight, every fight dealing with fight, fights is a massive fight. It's potentially putting him back five steps um, every time he fights. I think the logistics was a problem. I think he's out training in Portugal um, and, and Mark Tibbs is got a gym. So I think that might have been a problem, but it's, ne it's, it's not a good time, is it? Um, you know, they, they've had such a great relationship. Ron spot on where he says about how far he's come after the AJ fight, and it's no coincidence that after the AJ fight, he is when he is when he went with Mark Tibbs. Um, mm. The training, you know, is this well documented what he does up in Loughborough. Um, so hopefully he carries that on, and hopefully he gets in, you know, a, a trainer that can help him take that next step. But in, in answer to your question, no, it's not good timing. I was speaking to a few people about it, um, a potential replacement for Mark Tibbs. I don't know who the main number one man is in terms of his training right now. I tried to find that from Dean White a little while ago, but Dean unfortunately never answered his uh, messages on Instagram. I actually think, personally, I would like Manny Robles to work with him because I think when you look at what Manny Robles did with, um, you know, with Andy Ruiz, you know, after the Joseph Parker loss, you know, Andy, Manny Robles, transformed the career of him and if you look at the uh, the game plan that he he put out for the AJ fight he, he got it spot on and I, I, I there's something about the Manny Robles I think he's a good trainer he's got tons of experience you know he's um he's training all the way I think in um in LA right now I think mean, Manny Robles and Dillian White would be a good shout and I would like to see you know Dillian I, I've always said that I think Dillian White's been mismanaged in terms of promotion wise and everything you know I've I do believe if Dillian White was elsewhere, he'd have got a world title shot by now. Um, that's no, I'm not like slagging off Eddie Hearn and everything, but I just think when, when it comes to heavyweights, Eddie Hearn's got one thing on his mind, that's Andrew Joshua first and sod the rest. I really, mm. really think Dillian White, you know, someone like Bob Arum, maybe even the, the PBC, even Frank Warren would work wonders with Dillian White. And I do think to, to you know, take that extra step and perhaps go over to America you know, learn some more of the craft over there, and, you know, to, to kind of get together with a trainer like Manny Robles would, would work wonders for him. Because, you know, Ron just said it before, you know, can a fighter at a certain age learn new tricks? I do believe they can. 
I, I do mm. think that Dini White's capable of learning. Because I think Dini White's improved massively. I think he's improved massively. There's still a few faults in his, in his performances, but it happens with everyone, especially in that division. You know, nobody's perfect in that division. You know, every top what? fighter in that division has been down and has been hurt. It's just, you know, it's part and parcel of the heavyweight game. I've got another name for you, Faso. What about mm. Adam Booth? Adam Booth, well, you know, everybody knows Adam Booth's a, bit, a busy Experience man. With the heavyweight Under division, uh, with a heavyweight fight as well. Looked after David Hay. You know, worked wonders Exactly. With him. So, but he again, won the title. If, if, yeah. if Dillian White's and Mark Tibbs are parted ways because, you know, the 100% commitment's not there, you know, Adam Booth works with quite a few fighters in boxing right now. It's got to be someone that's going to give his 100% commitment to him right now. And again, like I said, Mark Tibbs, really nice person, nice guy in boxing. You know, very talented, knows what he's doing, works well with his fighters. Just look how he's brought up young um, Harvey Horn. He's doing a tremendous job with him, done a good job with Rappel. But, you know, Dillian White's at that stage of his career right now where he's not getting any younger. A world title shot's behind the corner. Win, lose, a draw. He's not going to get another world title shot after his title shot because, you know, look how he's been treated. You know, the second mm. that his world title shot's out of the way, no governing body's going to think, yeah, let's give him another world title shot. You know, the WBC have mugged him off for years now. So once he gets his world title shot out of the way, there's nobody, gonna, there's nobody that's going to be out there that's going to say, yeah, give you another world title shot. I think whoever takes over next, it's got to be someone that's been in the game, the heavyweight game, someone that's achieved something and someone that can get the best out of Dillian White. Um, Let me I put an interesting name. Go on. What would be very interesting? Ben Davison. <laughs> well, ben Davison Which... has, has always turned around and said he would never work, probably never work with another heavyweight because of his uh, loyalty to Tyson. Yeah, I know. I was saying interesting, but I think the heavyweight fighters they need the, the, the trainer that's going to keep them disciplined. I think that's the main thing for them. Mm. Is it's keeping them disciplined, keeping them in check, training on point, game plan. Yeah, you know it is. It plays a massive part in it. But I think having someone that you know you respect and you listen to, I think that's the main thing. And uh, Adam Booth's a great shot. You know he worked wonders with David Hay. They had that relationship. Um, but like you said as well, you know the other side to the coin is. Adam Booth's got how many fighters mm -hmm. um, and, and, and could he possibly, you know, give him that time that he needs? Yeah, interesting times. Ron, um, do you say Adam Booth? Is there anyone else out there that you think can get Daniel White to world title glory? <sighs> I think I, I, did, I did like the name Manny Robles, but mm. I, I don't know. I just think Adam Booth, British, but, you know, based, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure he, he wouldn't mind another getting another fight on his, uh, you know, under his um, stable uh, heavyweight title. You know, it looks great. It, it could be a short-term thing just to tie him over until that Povetkin fight, and then, then he can look far and beyond that. But whoever he has, he wants... If, he is that, if that Tyson Fury fight's coming along, he'd want that same trainer in mm -hmm. for, that, for the next fight as well. If the money's yeah. right... That consistency. If the money's right, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, can Ricky, learn Hatton. Ricky Hatton's uh, mm. up and coming. Ricky Hatton's got a good reputation. You've seen him work with Tyson Fury. I think again, it's a Tyson Daniel. Fury thing, isn't it? Mm. I think mm. there's there's loyalty there. Uh, I yeah. don't think they'll be breaking breaking ranks anytime Ricky, soon. Those Ricky, guys. Ricky Hatton and Nathan Gorman also went their separate ways. So I mean, Ricky's oh probably, really? Yeah, Ricky's focusing a lot on his son. If you look at if you follow Ricky Hatton on Instagram, him he's he's building Fair his son enough, up to be, so. you know. Um, there's loads of names out there and only time is going to tell. But yeah, I agree with you as well. So I don't think it's the right time. But then again, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. But that's all we've got time for for Podcast 15. Um, Ron, Asif, anything you guys would like to add before we bring pod Podcast 15 to an end? Looking forward to the um, the boxing. Um, tomorrow night, with yeah. the match room. No, yeah, tomorrow night, I mean, Frank Warren shows start tomorrow night. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it myself. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking for the match room, you know, their, their, their show. But that first show is going to be cracking. So, yeah. And it's really good to, and also um, really c glad to hear that Katie Taylor fight being made mm -hmm. with, uh, with Delphine Pursoon. Yeah. Now, because I thought Delphine Pursoon won that fight. Mm -hmm. And I watched that and I thought, shit, this is going to be the moment where Katie Taylor's going to lose her perfect record. Mm -hmm. I think she was robbed. Delphi we'll, we'll, so be, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking a lot about that fight on uh, next week's podcast. Yeah. Asif, anything you'd like to add before we bring the podcast to an end? No, not really. It's exciting to see 
British boxing back. You know, it's going to going to be a great show, and uh, let's see what happens. Let's and what happens. of course, we'll be bringing live updates of those shows starting from tomorrow night. So. If you want to find out what's going on in them shows, if you haven't got any access to BT Sports tomorrow night, just log on to our, just jump onto our Twitter account. We'll be giving you round to round updates, you know, which we do with the top ranked shows. And now, of course, with uh, BT Sports Boxing and Matchroom Boxing. Um, if they haven't already, they need to like, subscribe and comment and make sure they follow us on all the social media platforms. Asif, a pleasure as always. Ron, thank you as well for joining. Look forward to seeing you guys for Podcast 16. And that's all we've got time for, for Lights Out Boxing Podcast 15. Thank you, guys. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again. And that's it for Podcast 15 of the Lights Out Boxing Podcast. Mm-hmm.